Hello and welcome class. Today we in this lecture are going to be uh, completing and ending part four, which is going to wrap up and bring chapter one of this lecture series to a close. So far we have talked about uh, the definitions of things like atoms, molecules, physical changes, properties, uh, and in just the previous lecture we learned about the importance of units. So what we're going to be talking about to bring this chapter, this introductory like portion of the lecture series to a close, is formally how to convert one unit to another unit, as well as once the units have been converted and you are done with your calculations, how many numbers do you actually include in the reported value of your calculation? Because it's not arbitrary. Yes, there is actually a statistical significance to how many numbers you include in your reported answer. So that's what we're going to be talking about here and bringing chapter one to a decisive close. All right, so without further ado, no more pre-lab lecture or pre-lab, pre-lecture lecture. Let's just jump into it. All right, so why do we need to convert units? It's all about efficient communication. Right, so as we talked about in the previous lecture, if you've seen it or not, uh, we need to include a unit with our number because units help to give us context for what the number actually means. So again, something like 12 atoms has very different meaning than 12 bottles of Coke, right? Two totally different things. So sometimes we need to convert between units in order to communicate more efficiently with whomever it is that we're talking to. Uh, so for instance, if I here in America, oh, you really can't see red on red very well, but this is me, I'm here in America, and I'm talking to a friend of mine all the way over in the UK, and I say something like three feet, my friend is going to look at me with a little bit of a befuddled face before he says one meter, and you say yes, right? So it's, it's, about being able to make sure that you and your friend or you and your peer, whomever it is that you're talking to, are on the same page. Um, I once got into a, not like a serious argument, but somewhat of an argument with a friend of mine online, again, who was actually in this real world example from the UK, um, because we were talking about temperatures and how hot it was outside and without using a unit, uh, like he had said like, wow, it's just like sweltering hot here today. Cause also it's the UK and they have a like lower threshold for what it means to be hot. But um, he was like, yeah, it's like, you know, the upper side of like 29 degrees today. And I was like, 29 degrees, like that's not hot at all. What are you talking about? And really then like in that quick flash, of course, like I very quickly realized that he's using degree Celsius and I was thinking in degrees Fahrenheit, but 29 degrees Celsius very obviously is not equal to 29 degrees Fahrenheit. 29 degrees Celsius was uncomfortably warm for my friend because it's on the upper side of the 70s. Uh, and 29 degrees Fahrenheit obviously is like below the freezing point of water. So like two totally different uh, like experiences, despite the fact that the number is the exact same number. All right, so dimensional analysis is the process of what we use to convert units either between metric units, uh, interchanging the metric prefixes, between SI units, so we're going from things like, uh, you know, mass to the joule by um, taking into account um, additional things like distances and speeds, or we can convert between imperial units, things like gallons to cups, or of course we can go between any of these three examples. So from uh, metric to, whoa, to Fahrenheit to the standard or imperial unit here. So we're going to be learning, uh, like in this portion of the lecture, a really nice convention for converting units. You don't have to use this all the time. It is just a tool that I am giving you, but we're going to run through some example problems. We're going to run through some calculations. And yes, with these, like, as we're going to be going through in this lecture here, some more rudimentary examples that may seem like overkill, but as we continue throughout this lecture series, as we continue throughout the first semester of general chemistry, the problems and conversions will get harder. And so it's going to be much nicer to have this kind of convention to fall back on. All right, so dimensional analysis. In the process of dimensional analysis, we are going to need to create what is known as a conversion factor. 
I know a lot of fancy terms today. Conversion factors are a fraction in which the same quantity is expressed using one unit in the numerator and another unit in the denominator. So we're going to have some type of fraction where there's going to be a unit in the numerator, something like centimeters, and there's going to be another unit in the denominator, so something like inches, and the number that's going to be present in the numerator and denominator are going to represent the same quantity. So for instance, 2.54 centimeters is equal to one inch. So this would be an example of a conversion factor, and we're going to use it in the context of dimensional analysis. So this is the fancy name for the method of using conversion factors in order to translate from one unit into another. You know what, I'm a big fan though of the best way to learn is to do. So first we're gonna break down where did this conversion factor come from? Like, is there a nice kind of like simple way of putting a conversion factor together? AKA, how do you know like what units to use? Cause I just pulled this one out of the air. So like, how do you do it? Um, second, we are then going to demonstrate and work through a calculation of dimensional analysis. How do we actually then go about uh, using these conversion factors and converting units. All right, so two lesser examples. These examples I, as a disclaimer, will not be extracting into a separate video. These are kind of a walk along. I'm gonna be holding your hand through this, kind of demonstrating how to set up a conversion factor and how to set up a dimensional analysis kind of conversion. Uh, the next example problem, spoiler, there's another one, that is one that I will encourage you to do on your own and uh, you know, I will extract into a separate example video. All right, so first and foremost, we have this kind of smaller example. What is the conversion factor between inches and centimeters? Similarly, between centimeters and inches. Huh, that's puzzling. Okay, so we have two different conversion factors that we can set up. Now the key to setting up both conversion factors is the fact, the true unequivocal fact that one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters exactly, right? There aren't actually that many uh, like exact conversions between the metric and the imperial system, but this is one. One inch is exactly equal to 2.54 centimeters. All right, so this we can use then to set up not only the conversion between inches, like if we're going from inch to centimeter, so that's how I'll define inches and centimeters. So from inch to centimeter. And then the second conversion is, let's say we're going from centimeters to inches. So we're going in the re reverse direction. All right, so how do we do this? Well, we're going to use again the fact that one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters to do it. So if we want to set up a conversion that goes from inches into centimeters, what we are going to do is divide both sides by where we're starting from. So we're gonna divide both sides of this equation by one inch. So we're gonna take one inch divided by one inch because we're going to move it to the other side, right? Divide the other side by one inch. Now what this does for us is, first of all, the left-hand side becomes equal to one, just the number one. Well, the right-hand side now becomes equal to 2.54 centimeters, all divided by one inch, right? So I haven't simplified anything, nothing's been deleted, I just kind of moved it over. So we have the number one is equal to 2.54 centimeters divided by one inch. The reason why this is significant and why I want to emphasize how we put together this conversion factor is because that event, like definition of conversion factor isn't like, I don't, you don't need to memorize definitions if you know where they come from, if like what, what it means. So that's, that's what I'm doing here. Like you don't need to memorize what it means to be a conversion factor if you understand why it's useful. This conversion factor, 2.54 centimeters divided by one inch is exactly equal to the number one. Mathematically, one is significant because if you take one and multiply it by something, you just get that something right back. That's not interesting if you explicitly use the number one, but how about we use something that is equivalent to the number one, 
but functions kind of differently. So for instance, since this is the conversion factor that we have put together to convert from inches into centimeters, let's actually use it. What is uh, 7.8 inches in centimeters? Well, the way that we set up this dimensional analysis uh, type of problem, and there are plenty of different formats that get used. This is going to be the one that I use the most frequently. It's the one that I'm the most comfortable with, but any form will work. The important thing is that you're going to take 7.8 inches. You're going to take the value you're starting with and you're going to multiply that by the conversion factor, right? If you take 7.8 inches and multiply it by one, whatever answer you get is going to be equivalent to 7.8 inches. If we use though, instead of the number one, our conversion factor, which is 2.54 centimeters, all divided by one inch. Again, functionally, we are multiplying by one, but algebraically, what this ends up looking like is 7.8 inches times 2.54 centimeters, all divided by one inch. And as in the previous lecture, I mentioned you can treat units just like how you treat numbers. You can cube them, you can square them, you can uh, like have a square root of a unit. You can also divide one unit by another unit and they functionally cancel out, right? You take X and divide it by X and the X's disappear. You're just left with one. And so the only unit that survives this conversion is the centimeter. Numerically, the answer is going to look very different than the number 7.8. In fact, if you take 7.8 and multiply it by 2.54, uh, what you end up with is the number 19.8 centimeters. So yeah, 7.8 is not equal to 19.8, but 7.8 inches is equal to 19.8 centimeters. And we know that this is mathematically true because again, our conversion factor is equal to one. And if you take a number and multiply it by one, what you get is the number back. So this is a mathematically true statement that 7.8 inches is equal to 19.8 centimeters. All right, so this is how we use the conversion factors. I'm not always going to uh, rewrite um, our conversion factor as I did here, but this was more of a demonstration of if you take a number and multiply it by a conversion factor, first and foremost, you want your units that you're trying to get rid of, like for instance, inches, like we were doing here, you want the corresponding unit in the conversion factor to be in the denominator of the conversion factor. The reason why we can see explicitly here is the unit we're trying to get rid of gets canceled out by that unit, which is in the denominator where we want to go. In other words, the unit that we want to convert into, we want that to be in the numerator. The mnemonic that I use in order to teach my students that you want, like, how do you remember that you want the unit that you're trying to get into on the top is anytime you go somewhere in life, you always want to keep your chin up, right? No matter how difficult the circumstances might be, no matter how hard math is for you, you want to keep your chin up. And if you do so, you will always get to where you are trying to go. Similarly here, we're keeping our chin up. We are keeping the unit we want to move in the direction of in the numerator, we're keeping that up. In doing so, we're keeping our chin up and ensuring that the direction we are going into is where we want to go. All right, so that's how we can try and remember with our conversion factors, which unit should be on the top. Bearing that in mind, we can very quickly then answer, going back to the first example problem up here, if we want to set up the same conversion factor, but going in the opposite direction, if we're going from centimeters to inches, the conversion factor is going to look very similar. We're going to use the same numbers, except instead of dividing by inches, we're going to divide each side by the centimeter. In other words, the conversion factor to go in the other way is the exact inverse of the original conversion factor we looked at. So the one inch is gonna be on top, the 2.54 centimeters are going to be on bottom. Again, in doing so, we would ensure that whatever number in centimeters that's present over here on the left, that is going to cancel out because the centimeters in the denominator, just like how we saw down below here, they're gonna cancel out. And the only unit left 
is the inch. We want the inch, that is the direction we are going in, and so we are keeping our chin up, we are keeping our inches on top. All right, so here we have another example problem. This problem is slightly different in that we have multiple conversions present or that are being asked of us inside of this problem. Uh, we are told that one lap around a particular track is 255 meters. The question is, how many laps are there in 10 kilometers? So here again, there are a couple of conversions that we're going to need to put together in order to answer this question. You can either do uh, this calculation one conversion at a time, or what I'm going to demonstrate in a couple of minutes is how uh, we can tack multiple conversion factors together to kind of answer the question in one fell swoop. As previously stated, this example problem will be extracted into a separate video. Also, as previously stated, I would like you to try and pause the video and solve this question yourself. Can you figure out how many laps there are in 10 kilometers, provided that one lap is equal to 255 meters? Assuming that you have paused the video, I'm assuming now is the moment when you have unpaused the video. So welcome back. Let's set up and solve for this problem. Now again, the, like a good approach in solving this type of word problem where I know, again, if you're more uh, mathematically focused, if you're more mathematically skilled, this you probably don't even have to think about. But for those of you who are apprehensive about math, again, we're just taking this in bite-sized pieces. And there's no shame in doing that, right? You don't need to demonstrate that you can solve this problem in one fell swoop if you're uncomfortable doing so. So let's just break it down piece by piece. It's totally fine. The important thing is that you understand the process. So we're going to first gather the information. We're just going to break this uh, problem down again, word by word, sentence by sentence, piece by piece. So in the first sentence, we are told one lap is 255 meters. Now, mathematically, the is represents an equal sign. That is like, in my experience, 99 times out of 100 going to be true. If you see the word is, what this means is that there is an equal sign in a mathematic statement. The left-hand side, we are told that one lap, one lap is 255 meters. And here now, it appears as though we have the precursor of potentially being able to set up a conversion factor. The question is, which side do we want to divide to the other? Well, that can be answered by the following sentence afterwards. The question is, how many laps are there in 10 kilometers? All right, so we have some distance information pertaining to the meter. It's not exactly a meter. We have a kilometer. We have, well, the unit of the kilometer. Specifically, we have 10 kilometers. But 10 kilometers can be pretty easily translated or converted into the meter because we know just from, you know, metric conversion standards that there are 1000 meters inside of a kilometer. All right, so if we're trying to figure out how many meters there are in a kilometer, so that way we can figure out how many laps there are in a meter, it appears as though the first conversion we are going to want to get out of the unit of the kilometer and into the unit of the meter. What this means is that we're going to want to make sure that kilometers are in the denominator of our conversion factor, right? We're trying to get out of the kilometer and into the meter, so that way we can answer uh, how many laps there are in that meter and actually solve the problem. So we're trying to get out of the kilometer. We're gonna put that unit of the kilometer in the denominator. We're trying to get into the unit of the meter. So we're gonna put those thousand meters up on top. This will ensure mathematically again that our kilometers are going to cancel out. Now we could just put an equal sign here and say, okay, well there are 10,000 meters. But it, as I just said, we can uh, string together multiple conversion factors in order to solve this problem in more of a like concise calculation. So instead of just solving for meters and then setting up a second conversion factor for a second separate calculation, let's just set up the conversion factor and tack it right on here, times by. We are currently at this point, right? You are here in the unit of the meter. So whereas previously we wanted uh, meters in the numerator to get into the meter, 
now we are in the meter and we want to get out of the unit of the meter. So what this means is our second conversion factor, which is based off of this equivalence here, we are going to want the meters now in the denominator. See, we are currently in the meter. We want these meters to cancel. We want them to be on opposite sides of this divide. There are 255 meters in one lap though. And now we can see that we have uh, converted from our initial measurement that was 10 kilometers and the only unit standing is the lap. So we've been able now to, or we have, we did, we just did this. We set up a calculation to answer the question, how many laps used our conversion factors to specifically convert, leaving only the unit of the lap. So this calculation then in solving for how many laps there are, we are left with 39.2 laps. All right, so again, the number 10 looks very different th than the number 39.2, but if we take into account the fact that we have units associated with these numbers and along the way, all we've done is multiply by two different versions of the number one, 10 kilometers can assuredly be mathematically true uh, as a statement to be equal to 39.2 laps. All right, hopefully you were able to get the same answer as I did. If you feel more comfortable, again, kind of breaking this type of problem down into two smaller problems and you're not comfortable quite yet, uh, stringing all of these conversion factors together, totally fine, right? You can solve the problem in whatever way you are the most comfortable solving the problem. You can take as much time as you need on these types of problems since this is a lecture portion, totally fine. All right, so we've been doing a lot of conversions. We've been doing a lot of calculations. In the previous calculations though, right, just to go backwards by a slide, uh, we have presented that 10 kilometers is equal to 39.2 laps. Well, why did I say 39.2 and not just 39? Or why not 39.25? Or, you know, why didn't I include more decimals here? Like if your calculator gives you more decimals, shouldn't you include all of those decimals? And the answer is no, don't do that. <laughs> the reason why is that all of the information that your calculator is giving you is not actually certain or uh, like accurate information. A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Your data can only be as certain as you are uncertain. Every time we uh, like record or represent or report um, some type of measured value, right? There's a decimal, there's some type of approximation there. Uh, there is always going to be some level of uncertainty in that number that you are representing. So for example, if we turn our attention to the two beakers that are down below, and let's say each of these major tick marks is, mm, let's say 10, 20, 30, 40, and we'll even just say milliliters, right? Because again, what's a number without a unit? So we have 10, 20, 30, 40 milliliters present with these big tick marks in the beaker on the left. And similarly, 10, 20, 30, 40 milliliter marks in the beaker on the right. But in addition to these big tick marks, we also have these little tiny tick marks in between. What these tiny tick marks do is give us more information. We don't have to guess as much as to how much uh, like of a liquid that we have because we can see more tick marks. We can make a more accurate uh, judgment. So let's say that each of these beakers is filled approximately to this line. Well, in the beaker on the left, the only, or like the like most accurate decimal place that we can get a reading for is the tenths place. Any additional number that we tack on is going to be a guess because we don't have any uh, more detailed information than the tens place. So if our beaker is filled to approximately this line, we can make a guess that we are somewhere around maybe 23 milliliters. The two we know for sure, right? This line is above this 20 milliliter tick mark but exactly how much higher is gonna be where our guess is. So the 20s place, or like the 10s place, the value of the 20, this two here, we know. This three 
is a guess. If we turn our attention to the beaker on the right, however, because there are more tick marks here, we can make a more educated guess. In fact, our guess is going to not be in the ones place, but to the tenths place. We can guess one number further out because there are more tick marks here. So the uh, 20, again, we, this volume is greater than the 20 mark, but it also appears as though, like if we assume that each one of these tick marks, let's say hypothetically represents an additional two milliliters, we can see that we, it appears as though we're like directly on top of the second tick mark, which is going to be a four. The guess then, or the additional piece of information that we can include after this, since we are moving our estimate out to the tens place, uh, it appears as though the line as I have it drawn is like directly on top of the tick mark, which means we can say that we are pretty squarely at 24.0 milliliters where the 20 and the four now are known, and the zero is the guess. All right, so with more information, uh, all depending on like what form of technology we're using, how accurate the glassware is, how many decimals present on our thermometer, let's say, we have more known values, but there is always going to be at least one estimated value. And by, uh, conventional standard, we only re like report or record in our notes one estimated value. So every value prior to this last decimal is known, and this last one is going to be our guess. So anytime we are working on calculations from these types of estimated numbers, similarly, we only want to report one guess. All right, so how do we know in some type of like conversion or calculation, how many values then we should include, like which one becomes the guess. Like if, again, you punch numbers on your calculator and your calculator gives you like eight decimals, you're like, well, these all seem like valid numbers to me, so where's the cutoff point? In order to answer that question, we need to be able to determine how many of our values are significant not just in like the number on your calculator, but the numbers going into your calculation, right? If we go backwards, it seems like all of these numbers that are present, uh, like the 23, the 24.0, all of these numbers present seem to be significant, right? We have values that are known and we include one guess. But let's say you come across a number uh, and you're trying to figure out like exactly how many of these numbers are actually significant without knowing the context of the experiment that was performed. Well, there are a number of rules that we can use to figure out how many digits are significant. So that way we also have an idea for how many digits we should include in any type of answer based off of calculations, or I should say answer from calculations based off of these values that we're using. All right. so. Our first rule, all non-zero values are significant. So in the number 23, both the two and the three are non-zero values, which means both are significant. Both are significant, meaning that the number 23 has two significant figures or sig figs. And that seems really straightforward, right? Not reading ahead to these other rules, like, yeah, okay, so <laughs> a number that is comprised of two numbers has two significant figures. That seems pretty straightforward. And you're right, that one is really straightforward. The rest of the rules all pertain to what happens if zeros are present. Zero by definition is nothing. So how significant can nothing be? And the answer depends on how your zeros are being used. Is it being used simply as a placeholder or is it an actual recorded zero, right? To go backwards again, like our 24.0. This zero we included because it was our estimate. So the zeros tend to be where the problems lie. All right, so rule number two, all zeros that occur between non-zeros are also significant, right? These are like significant placeholders. So let's say the number we're looking at is 101, right? So 101 Dalmatians. This zero in between the ones 
really matters. Because if we remove it, we are left with the number 11, which is super different than 101, right? If the movie was not 101 Dalmatians, if it was 11 Dalmatians, it would be way less impressive. So the number 101, uh, all of the values, the ones and the zeros are all significant inside of this number. All right, rule number three. Or I guess like, yeah, so then in conclusion, 101 has three sig figs, right? If that's what we're counting is how many significant figures we have, I have to also include 101 has three sig figs. All right, so all zeros after the last non-zero are significant if a decimal point is present. Otherwise, they are not significant. All right, so we're gonna need a couple of examples here, right? I'm a big fan of examples. Let's say we are looking at the number 20 versus 20. All right, so the decimal point being present really tells us where the significance lies. So in the number 20 without a decimal point, what this uh, represents to us is that the two is a guess and this zero is just a placeholder. It's a placeholder kind of, I mean, in the same sense as like it was in 101. I mean, if we dropped this zero, uh, two is very different than the number 20. But here's another way to think about why this zero after the two, yes, although it is a placeholder, is not a significant placeholder. The number 20 can be rewritten in another way. The number 20, as it's rewritten in scientific notation, if this zero does not have a decimal after it, if it is solely just the essence of nothingness and is just a placeholder, this 20 would be rewritten as two times 10 to the two. We would drop the insignificant zero. So this is a good way to demonstrate like, yes, sometimes zeros are placeholders and in the sense of them being placeholders, they are important, but it doesn't mean that they are statistically significant. The two, if there is no decimal following it, there is a way that we can rewrite the number that drops it really signifying that the zero is just a nothingness. It's, it's just there. Turning our attention in contrast back to the 101, there is no way that we can rewrite 101 in scientific notation and drop the zero and have it still be the same number, right? The zero between the non-zeros is super significant. It's not only a placeholder, but it also has informational meaning. This zero in the 20 means nothing to us. There's no decimal, meaning that the best guess is in the tens place and the zero is nothing. Compare this, or I should say contrast this, with the 20 that has a decimal point here. The decimal point is significant in that it is relaying to us that the two we know. And it's the zero place now that is the guess. The zero point, uh, or the, the ones place, this zero, not only is a placeholder, but it is giving us numeric measurement information, like real information, the zero, is where we are like, maybe it's 21, maybe it's 20, maybe it's 19, but this zero is giving us information about either the accuracy of the glassware that we used, the accuracy of the scale that was used. And so if this value were to be rewritten in scientific notation, because the zero is important, we would include the zero when we convert into scientific notation, 2.0 times 10 to the two. Right, so when in doubt, we can use the decimal point to figure out exactly how many significant figures are present inside of these numbers where we have kind of trailing zeros afterward. If there uh, is no decimal point and we can drop the zero, like how, excuse me, like how we did in this 20, it appears as though our number only has one sig fig and the 20 on the right, where the zero actually gave us some type of information, the zero was an estimate, it was a guess, uh, we can see that this number has two significant figures. 
All right, so this third bullet point where the, you know, question mark, how do we consider the zeros after a non-zero uh, is really gonna depend on the decimal point. It's pretty easy to tell if we're in scientific notation because if we're in scientific notation, there's gonna be a decimal point and all of the zeros that matter will be included. If we're not in scientific notation, just watch out for that decimal point. The decimal point will tell you whether or not the zeros matter. All right, so we have two more rules. Rule number four, all zeros before the first non-zero are not significant. All right, so rule three had to do with zeros after, like at the end of the number. Rule number four is more of a formality because like we never write numbers like this, but you know, we could write a number with a bunch of zeros in front, 101.00000. All of these zeros in the front mean nothing. They're just kind of abstract placeholders for uh, places that like we don't actually need to put a number in yet. These are all insignificant. Again, there's, there's a reason why we don't write numbers like this. It's because we could technically write an infinite number of zeros in front of a number because they're all just placeholders. Um, but they're empty placeholders. They have no meaning to us. The 101, again, is where numbers are going to start giving us information. So this is the first non-zero, this first one. The zero between the two ones is important. Obviously the one in the ones place is important. There's a decimal point here and all of the zeros afterward, because there's a decimal point, are also all going to be important. After this zero, because there are no zeros included, all of the zeros that could hypothetically be out here are also insignificant. But the zero up until this point matters. So the number that is actually significant in this like scribbling now that I have written across this line, uh, the 101.00000, all of these numbers are significant. And so we would say that this number, although it's written in kind of a strange way, uh, has eight significant figures. Figures, there we go. All right, so again, zeros in front mean nothing. Zeros after the last non-zero could mean something or they could mean nothing. It all depends on whether or not there's a decimal point and how many zeros are explicitly shown. All of the zeros that could follow up afterwards, hypothetically, that are kind of present, but are all just empty placeholders, are all insignificant. They also don't mean anything. All right, and rule number five, Integers are perfectly accurate and they don't count. So it's not that integers, like there, I mean, there are a couple of different ways that like we can say it, like integers, either integers, either have infinite sig figs or they have no sig figs, like, the way that I write it uh, and the way that I teach it is just that they don't count. Like integers are NA. Significant figures need not apply. The reason why is like if a number, like an integer, is a perfect integer, if it's just a counting number, one, two, three, four, there's no estimate that needs to be made about it. There is no guess, right? If you're looking at a dozen, a hypothetical dozen, a perfect number 12, if this is the integer, well, we know that the one here is a one, and we know that the two here is a two. There is no guess. There is no estimate. There is no rounding. There is no measurement. This number is perfect. And so for that reason, uh, if you have an integer that is somewhere in your conversion, like again, just to draw this back, the reason we're talking about significant figures is we're trying to figure out how to like round numbers in calculations. If integers are present, you don't need to worry about them. They don't impact what these significant values are either from your measurement or in the other conversions. You just ignore them. They don't matter. I mean, they matter in the sense that like the numbers get included in the calculation, but they don't tell you where to round your calculation at the end of the calculation. 
say calculation twice. They don't tell you how to round your answer at the end of the calculation. Let's put it that way. All right, another example problem. All right, so let's take a, well, at least for me, let's take a break. <laughs> um, but yeah, how many significant figures are there in the following numbers? So feel free to take a pause, kind of mentally digest everything that we've been talking about so far and see if you can't figure out based on the previous five rules, how many significant figures are there in the following six numbers? All right, so assuming that you have answered this calculation or example problem, I guess you're not really calculating anything in this example problem, we're just counting. How many significant figures are there in the following numbers? All right, so let's break these down one by one. So each of our rules are going to apply at various points. So if we're looking at the first number pres or present here, 0 0.0035, uh, according to rule number one, all non-zeros are significant. And according to rule number four, all zeros in front don't matter. So all zeros in front of your first non-zero need not apply, they don't matter at all. So it appears as though because there are only two non-zeros and no additional zeros that actually have significance, we have two or significant figures present in the number 0 0.0035. All right, the number 1.080. This is a number where a couple of different rules are going to apply. First and foremost, we have a couple of non-zeros. So rule number one, we have at least two significant figures. There is a zero present in the middle of two non-zeros. So we know that this number is going to be significant. And we have a zero trailing at the end. So the zeros trailing at the end, again, according to rule number three, we will count if there's a decimal point somewhere preceding it. And yep, wouldn't you know it, we can see that there is a decimal point earlier in this number, which means that the zero at the end is a best guess. It is where the estimation or the rounding is, the uncertainty in the uh, like measurement that is present here which means that the zero at the end is also significant. So the number 1.080 has four significant figures. All right, we have uh, next up in line, the number 100.00, so 100.00. Non-zeros are significant, and all of the rest of the zeros are trailing after a non-zero. These zeros, again, will have significance if there is a decimal point present. If there is no decimal point, then none of them matter. Well, we have eyes with which to see, and there is definitely a decimal point present here. There is, uh, the number is 100.00. So because there is a decimal point here, all of these zeros matter. It is impossible to have uh, insignificant values in between, like, or how do I say this? It is impossible to have, yes, insignificant values between two different significant values. So if we have a one out on the left and these zeros after a decimal point that are super significant because they're following a decimal point, what this tells us is that all of these zeros in the uh, middle must also matter. So we're gonna have a clustering of significant values. All of the zeros that could be out in front don't matter. All of the rest of the zeros that follow after the hundredths place don't matter. We have exactly five oops, sig figs. When I write fast, my S's turn into G's, apparently. All right, three more values to look at. Uh, next up, we can see 2.98 times 10 to the fifth. Uh, this is a good example of how like scientific notation is really helpful in being able to figure out how many significant figures we have, because however many decimals are present, however many numbers are present in a scientific uh, or scientifically notated number, all of them are gonna be significant. It also coincidentally happens that each of these numbers is non-zero, and so we can conclude uh, pretty quickly that there are three sig figs in this number. The 10 to the fifth, we don't have to worry about any like significance here. The times 10 to the fifth is just a way to tell us like where the decimal point is in the like, 
a real version of the number. So the 10 to the fifth we can think of as just like an empty kind of placeholder. It just gives us direction for where the decimal point goes, um, but it itself doesn't have any like measurement significance to us. All right, fifth, we have the number 12. Well, there are two different ways that we can go with this. Because there are no units here, right, units question mark, we don't have any context for where this number came from. If it is a measurement, so if it has some type of unit like the milliliter or the gram or seconds, what this tells us is that the 12 is a measurement And if it's a measurement, there is going to be some level of certainty, uncertainty, that it's a recorded real number. And so we would say that this value has two sig figs. Another way we could go with this is if the unit is something that's more like a counting number. So let's say it's 12 eggs, right? A dozen eggs. What this tells us is that this is not a measurement. This is a counting number. It is an integer. And if it's an integer, it is a perfect number and there is no recorded uncertainty, um, right? Because if you're going to the grocery store and you open up a container, you either have 12 eggs or you don't. Like it's kind of a binary system. Either there's like an egg missing or it's smashed, but there is no like partial egg. You either have like 11 good eggs or you have 12 good eggs. Um, somehow by miracle, maybe you have 13 good eggs. I don't know how that would work. Um, but it's a counting number, it's an integer number. It's not a measurement. You are using, uh, you know, like a counting method to get to the number 12. And so if that is the case, if our unit was something like a counting unit, then we have no significant figures here. It's just NA. All right, last but not least, 2,371.28. This value is all made up of non-zero values, and because it is made up of all non-zero values, we are going to have six sig figs here because they're a total of six uh, non-zeroed numbers. All right, so once we have these significant values, once we have these significant figures, what do we do with them, right? They are a means to an end. The whole purpose is not to find significant figures just to be like, I know how many sig figs there are. It's to use that information. So if we are undergoing some type of conversion through multiplication slash division, which is what we do with unit conversions, we uh, the number that we report at the end, the answer, can only be as certain as the number of sig figs in the calculation. So we have to ask ourselves questions like, how many significant figures did the original measurement have? Were there any sig figs in the conversion factors? The answer at the end of all of your calculations then will be rounded to the smallest number of sig figs present in the calculation. That's what it means to only be as certain as you can be uncertain. If the like most, uh, or if the like the least accurate measurement you have is two sig figs, you can't meaningfully report like six significant figures because four of those are gonna just be like unnecessary guesstimate garbage. Like you can only report a or an answer that is as accurate as you are unaccurate. You can only be as strong as your weakest link. So in this kind of uh, hypothetical calculation, let's say we can set up the radius of a bromine atom is known at, or is reported is reported to be excuse me, is reported to be 185 picometers. 185 picometers is our initial measurement. Our question is, what is this radius in meters? All right, well, the way that we set up this calculation then, first and foremost, we need to figure out how do we convert from picometers to the meter. Now, all we need to do is look up what the conversion is, like what is the metric prefix of the pico? How do we get from uh, picometer to meter? And in looking this up, we would find that there are 10 to the 12 picometers for every one meter. So if we're trying to get out of the picometer and into the meter, again, we wanna keep our chin up. The unit that we want to be moving in the direction of should be in the numerator. So we're gonna put the meter up on top the 10 to the 12 picometers is going to go down below. 
Now the number one for the meter and the one trillion for the picometer, each of these uh, values that are represented here are perfect integers, right? We don't have to approximately convert from the picometer to the meter. The metric system is specifically designed so that the conversion factors are all perfect integers. And so for that reason, both of the numbers that are present in the conversion factor, uh, they're, they're not significant. They have no significance. Because they are perfect, we don't need to worry about how they are going to either like uh, increase our knowledge, decrease our knowledge, influence our uncertainty or our certainty. They just don't apply. And so the only measurement that is present in this conversion is the 185. Here we can see, because we have all three non-zero values, the uh, total significance that we have with our initial measurement is three sig figs. And so we can undergo this calculation, 185 divided by 10 to the 12. Our picometers are going to cancel out. Our answer will only be in the unit of the meter. And our final answer, we will then report with three significant figures, 1.85, not 1.9, not 1.850, 1.85 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. So again, you want to make sure that the number of sig figs uh, or the smallest number of sig figs somewhere in the process of the calculation, which in the example problem that we just laid out was three. This is how many significant figures you are going to also present in your final answer. So here's a fun exercise. You can go through the lecture that we've already been through, not only today's, but uh, part three from either yesterday or earlier, whenever you watch this video and see where did I correctly and where did I incorrectly round my significant figures in previous calculations. Uh, answers will be in either the description or the comment section below. So you can check your work there and check my work. How correct was I being and or how lazy was I being when running through the previous calculations so far? All right, the uh, like multiplication and division, though, are not the only algebraic uh, like tools that we can use when manipulating data, there is also addition and subtraction, right? Sometimes you need to average your data points or you just need to add up points, subtract points. You need to do some type of calculation like this. Addition and subtraction functions a little bit differently than multiplication and division. With addition and subtraction, you can only be as certain as the decimal place that you are in. So it actually, with addition and subtraction, we use it pretty uh, like, rarely in chemistry, uh, but the rules don't even, you don't even need to know how many sig figs you have. You just need to be able to pay attention to the decimal places in the values. All right, so let's uh, use the example problem here as kind of a showcase for what I mean by following the decimal points, uh, the decimal places. Again, bear in mind that when it comes to formally recording data, all of the decimals, all of the values up until the last data point are certain. So in 2.18, we know the 2.1. This 8 is a guess. This 2 in the next number is a guess. The 0 in the next number is a guess. And the 8 in the last number is a guess. All of these are where we rounded our measurements, and so that's where the uncertainty is. Well, if you take a number that you are certain about and add it to another number that you are certain about, well, then your answer is going to be certain. But as soon as you take a number that is uncertain, that has a guess to it, that has a rounding aspect to it, and add that to something that you either know or don't know, well, your answer is going to be also, uh, or will also contain some level of uncertainty to it. So how we pick out, uh, like, or how, I guess, like, how we pay attention when we're doing addition and subtraction to, like, well, where, where are the guesses is, if we kind of rearrange this calculation to the old school way that we write out addition and subtraction, we're going to stack it vertically. We're going to take 2.18, we're going to add 5.612, we're going to stack again all of the places vertically to make sure they are aligning properly. We're going to add 1.5870, and then we're going to subtract 1.8. Well, each of these last values 
uh, again, in these numbers, I'm gonna box, these are the ones that contain uncertainty in them. And so if we add a number that is uncertain to any number, the answer will contain uncertainty because, right, the answer is only as strong as the weakest link. So if we perform this calculation, like algebraically on our calculator, the number that we get is something uh, like 7.5790, just to keep all of these places present. Well, the zero was a guess, which means the answer uh, underneath has to be a guess. The two in the next uh, like decimal place over um, is a guess, which means the answer, this nine, also contains some measure of uncertainty in it. In the next decimal place to the left, the eight in, these, in this first number, the 2.18, has uncertainty, which means this seven has uncertainty. And if we move another decimal place to the left, the eight in the 1.8 contained uncertainty, which means this five is uncertain. And if we move to our, our last place, the ones place, here is where we can finally see that there is no uncertainty. This seven, smiley face, we know it's a seven. In fact, I'll even kind of put a dash. This is a seven that we know and we can trust. And so when we report a final answer from, uh, like, you know, using data, manipulating the data, adding, subtracting the data, we want to make sure that we are including all of the known decimals. So I'm gonna rewrite this over here. We're going to include this seven because it's the only known decimal we have. And we're only going to include one unknown value, right? All of the, all four of these decimal places contain uncertainty. So three of them are garbage and one of them is kind of meaningful to us. The first one right here, this five. Now, if we look at the next decimal place over, we can see that it's a seven. Uh, so by like algebraic rules, we're gonna round this five up to a six, but this is going to be the way that then we report what the final answer of our calculation is. 7.6, where there is one value that we are certain about, one value that we know, and one value that is our guess. This is our estimate. There is only one data point that represents any type of uncertainty in our calculation. All right, so what if we need to combine these two? What if you need to do multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction all in one type of like complicated calculation? Well, in that case, we are going to follow the algebraic order of op or operations, AKA PEMDAS. So we're going to uh, perform all of the calculations in the parentheses and exponents first, and then we are going to do multiplication and division. And last but not least, we will do addition and subtraction. All right, cool, good to know that just because we're doing uh, or keeping track of significant figures, we're not gonna be breaking the rules of algebra, but where do the sig figs come in? Well, we are going to round the sig figs at the end of each major algebraic step. So after we finish doing all of our calculations with parentheses and exponents, according to whatever rules apply, whether you might've been doing uh, addition subtraction or you might've been doing multiplication division inside of the parentheses, you're gonna round. Then you're going to perform any additional multiplication and division that is necessary, and then you're gonna round. Specifically, we're gonna round to the number of sig figs, and then the addition and subtraction you're gonna do, and you will round. Specifically, in this case, you will round not to the number of significant figures, but rather to the decimal place, as we just did an example for. All right, and then assuming that you've gone through each of these steps and all of your algebraic calculations are finished, whatever answer you have at this point will be your final answer, also with significant figures taken into account. All right, and that brings us to the end of chapter one and or in a more generic sense, this has brought us to the end of all of the fundamental definitions, calculations, terminology, nomenclature, et cetera, et cetera, that we are going to need to know in order to continue in this lecture series, continue in the first semester of general chemistry in my class. Uh, here we have some example problems where again, if you're not working out of the textbook that I am using, or if you're using a newer edition of the textbook I'm using, uh, the specific numbers are going to either be different or not present, all depending. Um, again, if you're in my class, double check. Uh, I will more than likely have the updated versions of these problems. If you would like more practice with uncertainty in measurements or using units, 
Um, the more updated versions can be found either like Blackboard, email, friend, whatever, um, lecture slides in person. Um, if you are not in my class and you're just watching this video, like you want to find some more uh, examples, again, talk to a teacher, talk to a friend, a parent, find sources online, um, leave a message like in the comment section below, whatever you want to do. If you want to, uh, you know, increase your base of knowledge, I'm not going to stop you. All right. There is, I don't think anything else really that I need to say or disclaim or explain. So do your homework. And until next time, class is dismissed.